Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining all of you that are joining live and for those that might be watching it afterward and uh, as a recording. We're going to be talking today about um, service networking and the security aspects to keeping that communication secure. We'll be looking at um, a few different technologies like WireGuard and TLS uh, and how they come together to uh, to provide security in a in a way that's more amen amenable to our cloud native type uh, architectures and and workloads. So my name is Christian Posta. I'm the global field CTO at Solo.io. Um, I've been involved in open source for quite a long time. I've been working on Kubernetes since before it was 1.0. Same thing with uh, the service mesh ecosystem. Very involved since January 2017 or so. Um, I've written a few books on this topic. Now, coincidentally, I just got an email from the publisher last night saying that all of Manning's books are on, on sale today. Um, maybe, maybe go take a look if you're interested. Um, but I've worked very closely with a lot of uh, solo customers and open source users that are looking to modernize their infrastructure. They're typically moving to some sort of uh, public cloud. They're adopting containers and technology like Kubernetes. And some of the models and paradigms that we use for managing deployments and observability, those have shifted and changed and we're trying to modernize. And now, you know, they're getting to the points around uh, uh, security and, uh, and networking. And that's where we're going to focus our, uh, our efforts here. So we're going to look at a, an agenda here that, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the need for some of these more modern security and networking changes. Uh, we'll look at some case studies, look at some technology, and I'm hoping that if I manage the time correctly, that we'll be able to uh, to look at some demos as well. So I, I work at Solo, and sort of the background is we, we work on these, uh, these application networking problems. We um, work with enterprises. We're adopting, like I, like I mentioned, modernization efforts at scale. And what we picked are, we believe, the best of breed products or, sorry, projects from open source that uh, we then use to, to solve some of these problems. And so you'll see some of these uh, open source projects mentioned in the, in the presentation here today. So we're going to start the conversation with what seems and appears to be a fairly simple diagram, but has a lot going on under the covers when it comes to networking and when it comes to security. Now, in this case, we're, we're talking about service A talking to service B, but when you think about how does service A find service B to talk to in, in, in the first place, especially in this, in, in a more cloud dynamic world, how can we observe what is happening? Like what happens, are, are we gonna know when calls fail? and uh, services are out of SLA and so on. Um, and and more importantly, who is service A? How can we prove who is service A and who is service B? In the past, we would think about who service A is based on where it's deployed. And we would think about writing rules and policies about it based on where it's it's deployed. It would communicate using things like TCP IP and, and so on. And this is still fundamentally in, in place when we talk about cloud native networking. IP is still, when you're talking about things like REST APIs and gRPC and so on, IP is still a foundational unit. Now, in, in previous generations of technology where we would use IP and, and network segmentation, we would use complex firewall rules based on these units of identity, where things live and IP addresses. We would use, uh, you know, like I said, firewalls and, and gateways and routers and all this to, to implement this. But as we move to adopting public cloud, as we move to things like containers and Kubernetes, it's th this world becomes a lot more ephemeral. Workloads can spin up, Workloads can, you know, become unhealthy and and get uh, get killed and move to different work uh, different hosts, uh, and everything's a lot more dynamic. 
And when you're going from on-premises to public cloud, you don't own that network anymore, right? That's AWS's or that's GCP's network and you have to live within it and write some rules about uh, how that fits. But sometimes that does that, those models don't fit the same way that they do on, uh, on, on premises. And what we see as part of that is the bad guys are out there. The attackers are out there. They are trying all kinds of different ways to get into what you've traditionally uh, might, might have thought of as your, as your network or your corporate network, um, using all kinds of different schemes, all kinds of different um, attack vectors, and a number of which can be used together to breach a, uh, a particular network. Um, and so this idea of thinking about security in terms of, well, if we just make a boundary and keep the bad actors out, then we'll be safe because that isn't the case. And actually there's a number of examples why and, and where that isn't the case. Uh, don't need to pick, mean to pick on this particular one, but here's, here's one that uh, came to my mind back in 2014 uh, where the, you know, the, the Sony hacks, uh, very sensitive emails were made public. Even pre-production films were made public and the attackers had very deep and, um, in a widespread access to Sony's networks. But this didn't happen because they just left a API gateway on unsecure or something. There was a number of, of things that led to this, including things like phishing and malware and so on. But one, one, one big part was that once they got inside of a particular boundary, they were able to move around. They were able to learn more and inspect and move laterally. And uh, that enabled even more of, uh, of, the, of, of the attack to, to unfold. And so when we start thinking about modern service networking and securing them, there are a few tenants or you know, some context that we have to have in place uh, that aligns a little bit more with what reality is. That these networks, we should assume that there's, there, is, there are hostile actors in this, whether it's internal or external that the possibility of breach, even though you believe your network is just you know, in, in, within your own uh, boundaries and perimeter, is susceptible to uh, da data exfiltration and service hacks and, and so on. So the way we should be thinking about standing up APIs, standing up microservices, standing up databases and caches and, and so on, is to authenticate and authorize and encrypt as much of this traffic as possible, even though it might be within your quote unquote corporate network. And some of the things that we need to, uh, to have to be able to write policies about, uh, about this is knowing who is whom. We want to be able to constrain who can call, you know, what services can call what other services under what circumstances. We want to also be able to audit and understand what calls are happening in our system. And we want to be able to deny or apply limits and constraints and so on while keeping the interactions between these services confidential. We don't want um, you know, bad actors that might have made it into our boundaries, into our networks to be able to see what's happening and understand patterns uh, about what's happening in, in our network. And lastly, we want to, even though uh, a service might have access to another service. We want to limit exactly what they have access to with uh, with fine grain authorization policies. Now, this is not some pie in the sky type uh, uh, theoretical aspiration. Uh, a number of organizations have implemented a uh, a networking and security posture that lines up with uh, with with some of these uh, these desires. And the, we're going to look at an example from from Google. And uh, slide. So Google published a, a paper on their application layer transport security. Oops, there we go. Um, that they built to address this, this uh, you know, these circumstances and this type of infrastructure at scale. And they ended up developing this back in 2007 uh, right around when TLS 1.0, 1.1 were, uh, were out. And at that point, there, Google had seen enough attacks on T SSL and 
CLS that they determined that uh, it, it, th that protocol is a little too complex, too many options, too many moving pieces and too many attacks against it that they would need to, they should, they, they wanted to go off and uh, and rethink how, how can they build a uh, security layer in their RPC uh, networks that, uh, that eliminate some of those uh, those um, um, you know weak weak points in the security. So what they what they did is, and you can go see this paper, is that they tried to pare down what they thought were the more secure algorithms for um, implementing the, the, the their security. They they created an identity model that can be layered on top of the workloads that are not tied to where a, uh, a workload is deployed. And uh, they, they tailored it very specifically to Google-isms. You know, Google uses protocol buffs uh, heavily. So they use protocol buffs to encode the cer certificates and, um, and, and the on-the-wire protocol and, and so on. And improve their security, like I said, by limiting to ciphers and, uh, and protocol schemes that uh, provide things like forward secrecy, authenticated encryption, and safe exchange of, uh, of uh, session keys and, and so on. The design and what they were hoping for was for this to be transparent to their applications. Um, that their authentication and authorization rules would be tied to an identity model that could be run you know, to, to be interpreted regardless of where it run or what the server name was or application name was. Um, and and so they, they they built this identity model. And what the way that it worked is the workloads RPC clients, when they spun up, they would go ask for a what are, what are they called handshake, handshake certificates that would allow this ALTS handshake to uh, to to occur and to occur in a way that can be verified and authenticated. They had this notion of a uh, signing key and the signing key would then um, issue the, uh, would, would sign the handshake certificates. And then when the RPC clients tried to connect with each other, they would, they would exchange and, and like I said, verify these uh, based on the root of trust. The protocol that they ended up uh, designing and, and building for this. Like I said, it was based on protocol buffs, uh, but it's uh, it, it, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the client sends its initial parameters and um, and uh, requests to, uh, to start a connection. The server will then use some of those parameters and its own parameters, create the session keys and present its certificate. And then at that point, the client can actually start talking in an encrypted way. Uh, and you, so you'll see this, this is a very simple one round trip time um, uh, handshake that enables then the subsequent uh, authenticated and encrypted communication afterward. So if Google built this, and Google built a lot of technology uh, that predates things like containers and um, Kubernetes and so on, should we be looking at rebuilding this uh, ourselves to be able to use something like ALTS our, ourselves? And the answer is no. Um, we haven't really seen that uh, adoption of something like ALTS outside of, uh, of Google because there are existing building blocks that, that can be used to solve some of these same, same problems. And more specifically, what those problems are, what, we trying, what we're trying to do is number one, get, get security, authentication, integrity, checking and, and so on into our network communications without having to go re-engineer and force all the applications to change and, and try to do it transparently. Um, things like focusing on simplicity, reducing the number of different ciphers and protocols and the, the complexity of a handshake to determine what to use. Um, let's, let's keep that as simple and focused on safe uh, ciphers as possible. We want I identity to be the focal point, not where things run. Uh, so we need some, some way to assign identity and there are uh, a number of ways to be looking at this. The first that we're gonna start off with is WireGuard. Now you may have heard of WireGuard. It is, uh, it is sort of the 
a big piece to some of the popular open source projects or even organizations that are built around it. Uh, things like Tailscale and, uh, and Cilium, you'll see it mentioned. And what it is, is a, a way to encrypt packets, datagrams that are running at layer three to provide confidentiality between uh, services and do it in a way that's transparent to the applications. So it actually, WireGuard lives, if you look at the at Linux implementation, it lives as a kernel module. It is focused on simplicity um, versus alternatives like, um, like IPsec, for example, which can be very complex, even if you just look at the number of lines of code in the, in the particular projects. Um, it actually uses a fixed set of, uh, of ciphers and, and, and cryptography. Whereas you, you see other things like TLS where you can negotiate a bunch of stuff. It it's actually uses a, a, a set of fixed ciphers. Uh, it doesn't try to get too creative with how it encapsulates this encryption. It just puts it into UDP packets. Um, and you know, it, it allows the, uh, the wire guard components to focus on doing what it, it does really well. And then the configuration, some of the pieces like how you exchange public keys and, and so on are expected to be done out of it. It doesn't try to con conquer the entire world like uh, maybe some of the other implementations do. So if you want to look at uh, an example between two hosts, um, WireGuard can be set up and configured using similar tools that you would for other network interfaces. So things like the IP CLI or if, if config. And all, all you need to do is give a, a WireGuard instance the public keys and the IPs which those are assigned into uh, into a configuration, and then WireGuard does all the rest. It will um, it will automatically encrypt the uh, the traffic going over this tunnel, and it will use it. It will it will encrypt it using um, very strong and, and known um, um, curves and ciphers and hashing algorithms that um, are known to be safe and uh, known to be performant. The, uh, the idea here with WireGuard, however, is if there is a vulnerability found, then don't just continue to support it, just you know upgrade and, and move to something that there are no vulnerabilities uh, known. Um, and this is uh, generally you know from a simplicity standpoint and from a security standpoint, uh, tends to be a good thing. However, there are some downsides to, uh, to WireGuard. Uh, being able to upgrade everything all at once is uh, is the uh, could be could be difficult, and uh, the implementers of WireGuard have, have made it very clear that they want to keep it. Uh, they want to support one set of uh, of ciphers and, and algorithms at a time. Maybe you know maybe they make some leeway for upgrades and so on. A, a, a bigger um, challenge is that WireGuard is not FIPS compliant. So if you're in a uh, an organization that needs to support FedRAMP type workloads, or um, uh, you know, very you're working with the U.S. government that requires FIPS compliance, um, you know, this this could be a, a hindrance, and and it probably won't become FIPS compliant. Uh, NIST and the federal government are pretty. Um, Let's say, let's say they're bureaucratic about how they pick what uh, what what ciphers they want to uh, standardize on, and the process for doing that, the um, you know the, the the roadblocks for doing that are actually quite high, and there doesn't seem to be any interest in, from the WireGuard community in doing this, um, going going through this uh, this compliance process. So it's likely FIPS will uh, WireGuard will not be FIPS compliant going forward. And the last piece is that WireGuard is fantastic technology. Um, and I do want to point out that just because it's not FIPS compliant doesn't mean that it's insecure in, in any, any way. But it doesn't do things like service-to-service -service mutual authentication or identity. Right? You will have to layer something on top of WireGuard to achieve those, uh, those capabilities. And out in the wild, things that we see people doing, things like... Uh, well, we'll just create uh, JOT tokens and have them signed by some uh, trusted secure token service. We have a layer in OAuth and we'll use these tokens to uh, to provide a layer of authentication while WireGuard provides uh, a confidentiality and, and encryption. 
or there are uh, other options. Maybe you create your own custom authentication mechanism and protocol. Uh, the Cilium project has, has done that. And we'll take a look at that in a second. Or you could just layer TLS and uh, uh, client certificates on top, which would give you or get you to that next level of uh, authentication. So in the Cilium project, what ends up happening is a, uh, a, a way of layering on top the mutual authentication process and then you know, allowing things to proceed under, under the covers as uh, encrypted traffic using WireGuard. So what happens is in, in Cilium, in, in, a, in a particular cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, you have uh, two different nodes on which there might be workloads, service A, service B. And then when service A tries to talk to B, in, the, in that node where service A is deployed, Cilium will check, hey, are you authenticated to talk to service B? Um, and if it's not, it will just drop the packets. It won't do anything with the, with, it won't allow the connection to proceed. But in the background, what it'll do is it'll go, uh, try to create a mutual TLS connection to the uh, to the node where service B is, or some other node, just to prove that service A can talk to service B with um, with uh, client certificates and mutual TLS. And if that connection succeeds, it'll stop the connection. It'll go mark in a little um, uh, map that okay A can talk to B. And then when the uh, TCP retry occurs the packet will then eventually make it across because it has been marked authenticated. Now, in this separation of mutual authentication and encryption, it's possible that the traffic goes across the wire unencrypted because the MTLS part is not actually tied to the, uh, the, the record protocol. But we, if we enable WireGuard, like, like we saw in, in previous uh, diagrams, then we can get that uh, confidentiality between, between services that has been mutually authenticated out of band. Right, so that's, we, we, we can achieve a, uh, a level of, um, of security with an approach that builds on top of WireGuard. If we take a look at PLS, Transport Layer Security, um, we can see an alternative, right? Because TLS implements things not at the IP or layer three level. It implements things much closer to the application at uh, TCP level where you know about ports and sockets and, and this type of stuff. And if we look at TLS 1.2, which is actually very common to be used uh, these days, uh, we look at the, uh, the handshake protocol, which involves a series of steps of exchanging uh, you know, protocol information, cipher suites, uh, random data, free master secrets, all this type of stuff, uh, certificates for authentication, and eventually through this uh, complex series of, uh, of handshakes, get to the point where we have session keys, we have authentication, and we can start encrypting data and uh, getting that confidentiality. Now, TLS 1.3, which was released in, in 2018, simplifies this a lot more. Um, the, the handshake in TLS 1.3 looks more similar to this, where a client reaches out and says, hey, I want to talk TLS 1.3. Here's a cipher I want to use, and here's some um, uh, parameters that I want to use for key agreement. The server says, OK. Uh, I like that. Here's the key agreement we're going to use. I'm going to start encrypting my response because by the time you get it, you should be able to de, you know, understand and decrypt it. Um, and then at this point, in TLS 1.3 in this handshake, we are ready to understand and encrypt data. Now, in an MTLS scenario, um, in that client finished uh, message, we can send the, the client's certificate to be able to perform mutual authentication. Um, and if you look at the handshake here and the, uh, we won't go into too much detail on the record protocol, but in the handshake, you can see this is a one round trip uh, exchange. It looks a lot sim more similar to what uh, we saw on the ALTS diagrams. Uh, and so for those, for those reasons, um, 
uh, TLS 1.3 is faster because it's, uh, it uses fewer round trips. It is uh, safer. TLS has uh, gone ahead and reduced the number of uh, ciphers and, and cipher suites that uh, can be used, including getting rid of uh, a number of ones that aren't safe in, anymore. And I, I think the list of supported ciphers in TLS 1.3 went from, uh, was it 20, it was like 30, 30 something in, in TLS 1.2 down to five in, uh, in, in 1.3. So we've significantly simplified the, the list of uh, ciphers that can be negotiated for uh, TLS 1.3 and focused on ones that are known to be secure so that in a, in a session establishment, you can't be tricked or downgraded into uh, more unsafe uh, protocols. TLS can do authentication uh, along with encryption and integrity checking. TLS does meet FIPS compliancy for those that uh, that need that. Um, instead of layering on JOT tokens and like and other things, you don't uh, really want to share those because if a JOT token gets recovered somehow, it can be replayed and reused potentially. Um, in TLS, we don't share those private key materials. We we publicize the public keys. Um, the the sessions are ended and uh, and terminated at the at the applications, at the at the ports, where the applications are listening. Um, and like I pointed out earlier, TLS 1.3 actually does kind of look like uh, the Google ALTS implementation, although it a bit late, but it 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 does um, it, it does look like that uh, implementation we talked about. Now, TLS doesn't have isn't a panacea; it's on its own. There is no way to specify or a standard way to specify identity. Um, things like issuing keys and um, identifying rev revocation and ro rotating those keys can be complex. Uh, do the applications handle them safely? We don't, we hope. Um, and every, every library, every framework is a little bit different in terms of how it, it does that. So it's not, that's not a, a bulletproof way just by saying, okay, we're gonna use TLS uh, to, to solve some of these uh, problems around identity and transparency and authentication authorization. But in terms of identity, you may have heard of a uh, open source specification called Spiffy. Now Spiffy aims to try to solve that problem that there is no real standard way of specifying identity in, uh, in TLS. And Spiffy sounds, or stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for, for everyone. Uh, it intends to solve that identity problem independent of what type of application on what network it's running or what, what cloud, public cloud or private cloud containers, VMs, it doesn't matter. Um, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Identity is specified with a uh, resource looking string and um, is, is asserted and signed by a, uh, some, some sort of authority that presents this in what's called a um, verifiable identity document. Things like an X509 or a JOT token. Uh, and, and the Spiffy implementations try to take into account that we, we prove identity by um, its context, where, where it's running, but you know, how it's running. And, and we do a lot more checking. We don't just rely on a, uh, a JOT token or a username or password, or we actually go look at the environment and say, okay, you say you're service A, are you really service A? Are you allowed to be service A? And then we attest that and prove that and then issue these, uh, these identity documents, these signed credentials that then service A can use to assert its, uh, its identity. Biffy operates kind of at uh, layer four, kind of at layer seven, just depending on the implementation. Biffy, the verifiable uh, uh, identity documents, they, like I said, can be used as uh, X509 docs or as JOT tokens. So the application then has to, uh, has to deal with that JOT token. So now we can solve this problem of who is service A. So service A comes online, it talks to the Spiffy workload API. 
and says, hey, I'm service A, get me, get me a SVID or one of these identity documents. And then the workload API goes and does some research behind the scenes. It doesn't just trust that service A says it's service A. It might go look at the host. It might go look at the process ID. It might go look at uh, labels and other contexts associated with, uh, with this process to determine whether or not it is service A and can it actually be service A. It's not somebody trying to impersonate service A. So this, this process is called attestation and the, the implementers of, uh, of Spiffy have an engine for, for doing this. I'll point out a couple of implementa implementations in a second. Uh, but then once service A has been attested, then we can issue a SVID document that can then be used to prove its, uh, its identity. And this, like I said earlier, doesn't matter what host it's running on. Doesn't matter if it's in containers or VMs or lambdas or anything. It, this, is a, this is independent of, uh, of where things get deployed and can be used across uh, workloads and across platforms. Now the, the SVID actually contains the string, that URI that I mentioned that describes the identity, which is uh, specified in a format of what is the trust domain for this particular uh, identifier? And then maybe there's some sort of hierarchy or, or way that we want to uh, structure our, our, our identity names, but then eventually what is the, what is the name? In this case, it would be service A that belongs to the bar organization uh, that lives under foo and is owned by this uh, trust domain. We can also issue JOT tokens, which uh, then get signed by the uh, signing authority in, uh, in the SPIFI implementation. And then these JOT tokens then can be presented as, uh, as proof of identity and you know, signature verification to, to understand that it was actually signed by the right authority. Now, if we use the X509 documents for our SVID, we can plug those in to our TLS 1.3 implementation and now get authenticated and secure communications between uh, service applications or, or, or APIs or microservices. Following a model, again, like I said, we don't have to go off and try to reinvent ALTS from the scratch. We already sort of have it. Spire is a uh, implementation of the Spiffy spec. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about, uh, about that, go to spiffy.io and um, there, there'll be a lot of information there about the spec, but also about Spire and actually running it, operationalizing it. And uh, I know at, at, at Solo, we use uh, Spire to, uh, to implement identity and workload identity across uh, workload types. So now what about, so we, we covered the uh, you know, encryption confidentiality uh, there's a few different ways to do that. Authentication, identity, you know, we talked about that. Now, how do we bring this together and do it in a way that's transparent to the applications? Because now we know who service A is, but we need a way to use those identity documents in a TLS 1.3 um, uh, communication and uh, do this in a way that doesn't force all the applications to have to change. And an example of doing this is in a recently, uh, well, not, I guess it's not that recent anymore, it was a year ago where we, we announced um, the sidecarless version of Istio. So Istio solves this problem and has solved this problem for a number of years by injecting a sidecar next to each of the applications. That was the intent to try to be transparent. So we didn't have to update the applications directly. We could just capture all the traffic that's leaving or entering an app and force it through the sidecar. And then in the sidecar, we'll handle this. But with Istio Ambient, we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to inject a sidecar. We can ha handle this stuff um, within the pods network namespace, but not in a sidecar. Um, and, uh, and, and so take, take a look at Ambient for a, an implementation of that. And in fact, I'm going to, I think, go into a, a, a demo now that shows some of these concepts that I talked about and illustrated here in action. So first, we're going to take a look at our environment. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but... Um, what we're going to take a look at is in the default namespace, we have a set of apps. 
we have the sleep application and we have the hello world application. And these apps can call each other um, without any, any problems, right? So if we come in here and we do call combinations, we can see sleep V1 can call v hello world V1 and sleep V1 can call hello world V2 and so on, right? But what we wanna be able to, we want to be able to restrict who can call whom. And to do that, if we take a look at, um, we, we'll take a look at maybe using Cilium or CNI to be able to do that restriction. We'll take a look at uh, mutual authentication and approaches for, for doing that. Um, however, if, if you'll recall earlier in the, in the talk, I mentioned using IP, addresses as the unit of um, policy can end up breaking down at scale. Now let's uh, let, let, let's take a look here. So if we look at, um, we'll start off with Cilium and we'll, we'll, we'll list our services again and we'll, we'll enforce a policy or set up a policy that says Leap V1 can only call uh, Hello World V1. And that sleep V2 can only call hello world V2. Actually, that's supposed to say that. So, um, so what we're gonna end up doing is looking at our policy document. This happens to be Cilium. The implementation is not, uh, not, not that important, but what we're saying is for hello world V1 can only be called by hello world or by sleep V1. Sleep V2 cannot call hello world V1. So let's apply this document, this configuration. And let's also set up a, a policy for sleep v2 and hello world v2. Those can, sleep can call hello world v2, but sleep v2 cannot call hello world v1. So let's apply this as well. And now let's take a look at what's happening under the cover. So as I, as I pointed out, Cilium does layer a MTLS um, mechanism, or sorry, a mutual authentication mechanism on top of uh, encryption on top of, the, of WireGuard. So what we're gonna see uh, down here is, uh -oh. Uh oh, I hope I didn't mess up the demo script here. Uh, I did. Give me one second. Why didn't that work? What are the chances that uh, live demo fails after I'd gotten it working seriously 20 times? <laughs> uh, let's see if we can do that. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to capture packets in the uh, in in Cilium, and when we make those calls, what we're going to see is the MPLS handshake happen. Remember, that's how we assert the uh, identity for mutual authentication in Cilium. But then we don't use the encryption part; we delegate that to um, to WireGuard. So if we now make some calls, we should see that uh, some calls succeed. The ones that we expect to fail actually do fail, and in the bottom pane, we can see that that authentication handshake happened using uh, M MTLS. But then we can also see that sleep V1 cannot call hello world V2 and, uh, and, and vice versa, that sleep V2 cannot call hello world V1, which is what we want, right? Um, right, network policy is, uh, is in force. Now, the way that this is enforced under the covers is Billium has a mechanism for specifying identity. This Cilium identity is not Fifi, uh, but we can take a look at, uh, at what it is. We can see that in the default uh, namespace, we have four different identities. It makes sense, we have four different services. And if we look at one of those identities, 9058, which represents sleep V1, we can see that it's 
it's it's created this identity is created by a set of labels. So we go and we see and understand some context about what a uh, workload is, and then we assign an integer to it, and that's that's the identity. If we look inside of uh, Cilium's agent, what we can see is that this identity under the covers for Cilium to understand and apply network policy, it has to be looking on the wire at, well, what, what is the workload? What, how can we identify this workload at runtime? It does that by using IP addresses. And so it builds up this, this list or this map of IP addresses that are mapped to identities on a particular host. And whenever connections are made, it looks and says, okay, are you this IP address? Okay, you're this identity. Okay, I have this policy attached to, to this identity. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna scale up the number of uh, sleep uh, V1 replicas. And what we're gonna take a look at is how this identity mapping with IPs is not as uh, as foolproof as as we want it to be. So we'll give it uh, a second for our scale up to happen. So we scale it up, sleep V1. And if we look in this cache now, we can see for this particular identity, we have a number of IP addresses. We have a number of, uh, let's come over here. We can see sleep V1 services, um, each with their own IP address, but they're all mapped to this one identity in, in Cilium. Now, what we're gonna see here is this identity and this mapping between IPs is susceptible to some types of failures, All right? So let's simulate in, in a, a scenario where the node on which some of these workloads run can't for some reason communicate with the cube API. Now this can happen for a number of reasons, uh, network issues, the, um, Cilium agent is inundated with updates and is slow or doesn't have enough resources, can't, uh, can't process these. The cube API could be slow. Maybe one of your cloud providers is doing something on the back end that's uh, causing some issues with the, the cube API to be slow. Uh, so what that means is the node that is watching for pod changes and IP address, all this stuff that's trying to map to the Cilium identity could get out of sync. Right, the, it's intentionally, Cube API is intentionally or has been designed to be eventually consistent and can get, you can get into scenarios where things get out of sync. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna try a few things here to see if we can get the uh, IP address that was assigned to sleep V1 to get recycled and, and assigned to sleep V2. Because if that happens, we could potentially, sleep V2 could call hello world V1 which it did in this case. We, we ran a test, cycled some IPs, and in fact, a sleep V2 IP address did get assigned to, uh, sorry, sleep V1 IP address got assigned to sleep uh, v, V2, which then under this type of uh, mapping to IPs for identity can get tricked. And we don't, we don't want that, right? So let's take a look at uh, a, a, another approach. Instead of, delegating the uh, policy to an, a, an identity that's mapped to IPs, why don't we enforce policy that's tied to identity that is asserted on the connection itself? And that's what we're gonna do here with, uh, with this deal ambient. So to do that, we're gonna, we're gonna put the cluster back into a, uh, a state that allows the, the node to reconcile and to, to get all of its information. So we'll eliminate that, uh, that communication issue between the, the, the node and the cube API. And then we're going to install Istio Ambient Mesh. Now Istio Ambient Mesh is a sidecarless implementation of Service Mesh that actually implements the Spiffy spec and uh, uh, ties that to a TLS 1.3 connection like we talked about in, uh, in in our talk here. So if we take a look and cross our fingers, hopefully things are coming up. Uh-oh. Uh, you know what? Give me one second. We run a bunch of demos. And then 
the last step, which is just setting it up for the live demo, um, that uh, that part gets gift. Uh, so give me a second. Let me get the. Let me download the. And I was hoping to pre-cache these so they uh, it would go a lot faster. But instead, we're gonna have to wait for some of these images to come up and to get loaded correctly. Which it looks like now the SDOD control plane is, and some of the other pieces are are starting to come online. Maybe. Uh, give it a second. Uh, so while we're waiting here, hopefully it'll uh, eventually come up. But what, what we're going to do here is we're going to set up Istio Ambient Mesh, bring those workloads into the service mesh. We're going to run that same um, that same test that shows the node failing to talk to the Kubernetes API, and then show that since the identity is asserted and authenticated, on the connection on the wire, it doesn't matter what these different IP caches are doing. And what this will show is how, you know, we, we talked about earlier um, some of the attacks that we've seen at other organizations. They don't happen because there's just one big gaping hole. There's a series of different weaknesses in, in the system that could be exploited at just the right time, just the right circumstances. But what we want is defense in depth. Um, and to be able to have networking policy to control things at the IP layer is good, but we also need to have uh, a layer that um, um, asserts authentication so on at the application layer as well, or, or the higher up in the stack. Okay, so we have Istio Ambient Mesh installed. We're gonna bring those workloads into the service mesh and specify authorization policies like we saw earlier. Uh, sleep v1 can only talk to hello world v1. Sleep v2 can only talk to hello world v2. Right. So now we uh, we got that in place. If we come over here, we look at the Istio system namespace. We do have uh, a number of components, including the control plane, the uh, the workloads in the default uh, namespace are let's see uh, are part of the Amb ambient mesh, we've labeled them correctly. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna demo that wrong identity again. We're gonna get into that same state where the node cannot talk to the Cube API server. We're gonna cycle through and get to a state where uh, a sleep V1 IP has been assigned to a sleep V2 pod. Uh, which would allow us to go around that network policy. But then we'll cross our fingers and hope that since we now have defense in depth, uh, that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll catch that um, we'll, we'll, we'll catch that at connection time and disallow the connection. So let's see. We're, we're starting to scale up, scale down, try to get uh, the system into a state where sleep v2 has a sleep v1 an old sleep v1 ip address now we're trying and we did get into that state now we're trying to call it and it's hanging up it's not doing anything we're not allowing that connection to succeed and this is because on the wire as the connection is being made we are um, doing the mutual authentication in line with, um, with 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 the rest of the security and we're doing this transparently as i mentioned the uh, the default, if you look at these these workers, they don't have sidecars. Istio is running and and uh, and uh, applying its policies, but it doesn't have uh, sidecars. So we're able to do this in a transparent way. So that's that's all I have for uh, for day for today. I think we I think we did pretty good here on time. I'll leave you with a few additional resources, including links to things like. Um, uh, ALTS to the WireGuard spec, uh, understanding a little bit more. I didn't. I purposely didn't use the phrase zero trust in this uh, in this session. It's become too much of a marketing term. I tried to cover the concepts directly, and uh, but but obviously there's there's a lot more to uh, to this, and I uh, left a few links for uh, for that. Uh, I'll leave a, a link to academy.solo.io. 
this is a uh, it's a it's a place to go and uh, get your hands on with these types of technologies and do that in a free way with a self you know we, we provisioned the lab environment you it's a couple clicks it's running on instruct and and, uh, and we guide you through understanding how cilium works how uh, istio works how envoy proxy works and some of these other other components that can be used to build a modern and secure uh, application network. So with uh, with that, I, uh, I want to say thank you. I want to, I'll leave my contact information here, both email and uh, Twitter uh, address here or handle here. Reach out to me anytime. Happy to take questions offline. Happy to take a look at uh, people are asking uh for a copy of the slides yes the slides will be made available uh people are asking about a copy of the demo uh yes that's already on github i will uh i'll make sure to put a link in the slides to um to to, to the demo as well yeah so with that uh thank you all for joining and uh, like I said, reach out if you have follow-up questions. Slides will be available, and hopefully, this was worth uh, your your time here. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.